The Mindfulness and Grief Podcast offers compassionate insights for coping with grief and life after loss. I'm your host, Heather Stang. Welcome to Episode 3. Today we will be talking about sibling loss with Renee Nickel, who is the author of the book Always My Hero, which just came out in this July, actually. Welcome, Renee, and thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank you for having me. So, Renee, I was wondering if we might start by maybe sharing, uh, you know, the background of, the, of your experience as a sibling who's, who has experienced a loss. Well, um, my brother and I, we were uh, just a little over two years apart. Um, we uh, grew up in a divorced family, and we were just uh, very close. I mean, our, our, our parents divorced when we were young. So, um, you know, we just, we grew up together. And, um, you know, once we became adults, we actually got married the same year as each other. Um, you know, we did the family vacations together. We did, you know, um, a few just Christmases and, uh, you know, our, our kids grew up together. So we were just, we were just, our families were close. And, um, and then, you know, he was tragically killed in Afghanistan and, um, uh, actually right before Christmas, uh, December 14th, 2011. And so you and your family are a gold star family. Correct. And your brother is a hero. Yeah, he is. And hence the title of the book, Always My Hero. Mm -hmm. And so what has your experience been as the sister of a hero who's died in the line of duty? Is that is that different? Do you sense, you know, your sense, is that different than maybe um, other types of loss? Um, well, I can't, I can't speak for, for other types of loss. I mean, I've lost um, you know, grandparents and um, friends in high school. Um, but for me, you know, losing my brother was world crushing. Um, and I, and I don't even know how to describe it anything other than, you know, um, just a complete and utter devastation to not only my life personally, but my immediate family unit, my, my husband, my children, and, you know, and then everybody else, you know, so, I mean, I can, I can see it even as far as, um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, friends. I mean, it was, it was very, very devastating and, and still is. Right. And as you mentioned, yeah, each loss, I mean, each loss is unique, right? Grief is incredibly unique and personal. You know, each, each person we have a special relationship with. And yet there are also some similar textures, I'll say, to certain types of loss. Like if you lose a child and you talk to other parents who've lost a child, there tend to be some similar themes, although, again, the story is very personal. Yeah. And so for you, um, as you've moved through your circle of people, you know, and I know you and I have met through TAPS, the Tragedy right. Assistance Program for Survivors that serves families of military loss and veterans. So, you know, is there anything in particular that stood out for you that maybe as a tribe you've kind of noticed any types of themes? Um, themes, you know, um, between, between siblings, parents, children, um, I would say that the loss is so incredibly unique to mm -hmm. each one. Um, and I think everybody feels, uh, like, their loss is the most important. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, so, you know, maybe a spouse feels like their role was the most important loss and the parents feel like their role was, you know, the most important and siblings, you know, I call it the forgotten mourners um, because, you know, we feel like our role losing a sibling is just as important, um, but we feel unheard. 
And so, yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of validation for the sibling law. So, right. Well, and, and I think you're, you know, I've been talking to clients and, you know, witnessing sibling loss in my family, which some of you know, um, both of my parents had lost a brother by the time I was seven. And so I grew up in the family dynamic where my parents were sibling, bereaved siblings. My grandparents had lost children, you know, and, and each person in that whole family system had a very different take and role because they had a very different relationship. Yeah. But, but I did witness what, what you have, have said, the forgotten mourners, the, mm -hmm. the feeling unheard. Yeah. Yeah. So can you speak more about that for you? Um, well, for me personally, you know, you know, after, after a sibling loss, you're not walking around, you know, calling yourself a forgotten mourner. You're not, you're not self-aware that your grief is being put off because really you're just trying to cope. You know, you're just trying to get through the days. And for me personally, I felt like, um, I felt guilty for, uh, telling my mom, you know, that I was hurting, uh, because my brother wasn't here, you know, so it's, it's in the conversations with people where you kind of feel that little, you feel withdrawn because you don't want to mention your pain because somehow it should be less than the parents. Um, and so it's, it's more of a, um, it, it just becomes like a habitual thing that just kind of adds up over time. You know, I don't yeah. think I was ever really feeling, I mean, I felt lonely, but I think that was part of me trying to process grief. And I went through the depression, uh, but at the time I couldn't really see that I wasn't processing what I needed to process. It was more of a stuffing, I guess. Yeah. None of us really go through those early days, months, weeks, even maybe years of grief yeah. with complete self-awareness and clarity, right? Oh. It's very foggy, very fuzzy. Yeah. Um, and it might, you know, I'm wondering for you, was there a point in time where you kind of realized that that the experience you were having, you were having it when you became aware that you were feeling forgotten or that you um, were aware you were kind of regulating what you were saying and doing? So, so I honestly, I can tell you that um, in, in my, my personal life, there was a lot of difficult family dynamics. And, um, and sometimes I think when we don't want to process what's happening in our own life, we tend to get involved in, <laughs> in other areas of people's lives to, because it, maybe it seems more exciting. Maybe you feel like you're, um, you know, being the hero for somebody else, you know, and, and so your own junk just gets put off and you, you're just saying, Oh, I'm going to deal with their junk. And so really, um, I can see it now looking back that I really had to separate myself from, um, some, from certain people in my life because it wasn't, it wasn't healthy for me and I wasn't dealing with my own grief. And, um, and once I separated and it forced me into, and I'm not saying everybody has to do this. So if you have people around you who are a great support system and they are loving and they are helping you and you feel free to, you know, to grieve in your own way, that is wonderful. Keep that support system around you. Um, for me, I was displacing my grief. And, and so once that was out of, out of the way, I was able to really focus. And, and that was probably a couple of years after my brother died. Um, and so I actually started writing my book in 2013. And, and as I was reading, or as I was writing it, um, I realized, 
this, this is an absolute disaster. I cannot do this right now. I'm in the beginning stages of dealing with my grief, even though I was two years out, but you know, so I, I just, I put that on the shelf and I just began to work on me and it was a several year process. Well, that's going to be a great comfort to people who are listening, who are maybe a couple years out because there's all this societal pressure to hurry up, you know, hurry up in your grief, Um, you know, even to the point where (laughs) there's a man on the street uh, survey that was done where they just asked people, how long do you think grief lasts? And, And people were saying things like two weeks, three days. It was shocking, right? You're just like, well, obviously they've never had a loss. Yeah. Um, but even people who have had a loss can become, you know, if you're far enough out from your own, your own pain can kind of be like, okay, okay. And even those, those uh, labels of, oh, she's doing well. Like, what does that even mean in grief? Yeah. I don't know. She alive? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> if she's breathing, eating, and sleeping, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what you mentioned about um, just just the the writing, you know, I'm I'm fascinated to hear. You know, you started writing. You felt like it was too much. You backed off, and then did you? Mm-hmm. You how long before you dove back into your to rewriting your narrative? Really revisiting uh, your was, narrative. It was four more years. Wow. It was four years. Yeah. And there's a lot of intense things that happen in those four years. So, you know, some people might, might be discouraged by hearing that they might be like, you know, I'm almost seven years out and someone who's a year out is probably thinking, wow, seven years sounds like forever. Yeah. And, and I mean, to me, it's like, it's a, it's a flash. Like, I feel like it just happened yesterday but not, you know, like I, there's, there's a emotional growth that happened in those seven years. So even though it feels like in my heart that my brother just died, like, I can't believe it was seven years ago. Um, you know, there's been a lot of emotional healing that's happened in those seven years. And so someone who, who is only six months or a year out, Um, And I talk to these gold star siblings, you know, I talk to them online. I talk to them through email. I'm always like, Oh my goodness. Like they're so fresh in their loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, I wish there was something I could tell them to encourage them that um, I don't know if it necessarily gets better um, but you can come to a place where you can be happy. Like I, I really feel happy in my life, but I also at the same time miss my brother terribly. And you can, you can do the same. You can do both. You can be happy and you can also, you know, miss somebody with your whole heart. And that's the mindfulness aspect, I think, of of this. You know, mindfulness, I like to think of as this big ampersand, a big and sign. Mm-hmm. It's not saying you have this or that. Yeah, You can have this and that. You can have the pain of the loss and the joy of the memories or the pain of the loss and, and the joy of helping other people through the loss. Right. And each person has to come to it on their own. And, of course, right. nobody has to come to it, you know. It's again very personal, but I think you are offering hope. Number one, you're sitting here. You know, you've been able to share your story in a way that is already. It just came out what July fourth, right? And and you were on Fox and Friends, and and you got you got to share it with the nation, and it's already having an impact. um, I'm sure on Gold Star families and people beyond beyond that circle. And, you know, it might be good for a moment just to explain what a gold star family is because not everyone listening to this is going to be familiar with, with military loss. Can you just maybe briefly speak to what that is? So um, a gold star family is a family who has lost a loved one during active duty. Um, and, and I really feel like while I am a gold star sibling, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of families who have experienced a loss because of active duty service. 
And so I really want to include them. Um, I really want to include all of those siblings who have had a military related loss, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there's, there's suicide after, after active duty service, or there's um, injuries that occur, you know, after that, that happen while on active duty service, but sometimes they don't pass until after, you know, they've gotten out. And there's just so many hurting people that I, I don't want to be just inclusive of gold star. Well, I'm very honored to be a gold star sibling, um, you know, but that, that, but the term gold star sibling is for someone who has lost uh, a brother or sister, son or daughter or spouse in active duty service. I appreciate your inclusivity because one thing that we know isn't helpful is when you start to give a hierarchy to grief, Correct. you know, even within the family system, as we were saying earlier, where this person's, you know, the parent is, mm-hmm. is more important than the siblings. Right. More. It, it is different for each one. And so maybe this would be a good time to circle back to, to family dynamics. You know, what can you share with us about your observations there? Um, you know, I, I think I, well, I've talked to enough families um, through TAPS, um, different, you know, different seminars I've been to. I've talked personally to different, um, you know, siblings and family. It, it's just, you know, it's kind of nature of the beast. Family dynamics change. And as much as you don't want it to change, um, it, it just does. And, um, you know, sometimes... What, what I really think it comes down to is everybody's trying to process their grief in their own way. And definitely in those first couple years, people are not thinking clearly and everybody is in a self protective mode. It, it's just self preservation. You're, you're just, you're trying to survive. And so, and that's when I think things really begin to fall apart in families is in those first and second years. Um, I personally have experienced it. Um, and, and I've seen so many other families experience it and, um, I haven't really, I don't have experience with the reconciliation part. I don't, I don't know if that happens. Um, I believe it can happen uh, for families, but you know, my story is not this whimsical, you know, um, fantasy story with this beautiful, happy ending, you know, where everybody just comes together. I mean, that would be wonderful, but it just, it doesn't happen that way for everybody. It didn't happen for me. And so it's, trying to find happiness in your life as an individual um, and being okay that families do change, you know, family dynamics do change. Um, and that's just, I think that just comes down to people trying to deal with their own grief in their own way. So what are some of the things you did for you so that you can now find some happiness and peace and, and equanimity in your life while in the other hand, holding on to that loss? You know, what, what did Renee do to be, Uh, to get from there to where you're sitting right now? Well, I did a lot of therapy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I, I mean, I did years of therapy in and out of therapist's office, just, um, I did a lot of talk therapy and to me it was not helpful. Um, it may be helpful to, to some people, but I can tell you that the, the biggest thing that happened, the biggest impact that, that happened for me was when we moved to Texas, we found, um, and I don't even remember how we came across this organization, but I started hearing about equine therapy and working with horses And so I started looking up equine therapy in Texas and saw that they specialized in combat veterans, PTSD, um, you know, they just um, traumatic loss. And so I just started making phone calls. I found a, um, I found a uh, equine therapy um, nonprofit 
about an hour away from our house. They were, they're called uh, Paws for Reflection. I mentioned <laughs> them in the book and they help out veterans. And, and I just remember just pulling up to this beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, just pastures and um, all these really beautiful horses. Uh, and, and that was just, um, that was just the most therapeutic thing that I, that I did was, was the equine therapy and, and working with these massive horses. <laughs> Can you say more about what you did there? Because I'm, I know equine therapy exists. Yeah. I don't know what it, like, what is that? What do you do? What do okay, you do? Do you so just hang out with horses? You do. Okay. Wow. So, so um, my first few sessions were hanging out with horses. You're, you're basically um, just sharing a fence with a horse and you're talking with a therapist and she's prompting you. She's asking you questions and, and she's kind of reading the horse as you're, as you're talking and reading his behavior, because a lot of people don't know this, but horses feel human emotion. And so they actually display what you're feeling. So if you can't name what you're feeling, your horse is going to tell you through his behavior. That is fascinating. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. And I was a skeptic until I realized that, yeah, these horses are, I can't put to words what I'm feeling, but I see that this horse is starting to walk away from me and I'm, and I'm realizing, okay, I'm starting to feel fearful. You know, I'm, he, he's backing off because I'm feeling afraid. So yeah. Wow. You know, this, this yeah. reminds me of, of drama therapy as it applies to grief. I know that there's, there's people out there who will work with a bereaved person, like let's say a mother whose son was um, shot in gang violence and they will in front of her, she sits and witnesses them act out her grief wow. or even act out the, the death, you know, acting out different aspects. So it externalizes the story mm -hmm. and it also helps create a narrative and you know dr robert niemeyer and a lot of other grief grief therapists have done research around the importance of creating our own new narrative and, and in order to do that we have to know what our narrative is yeah. and so it's as though the horse is externalizing your experience yeah you know, so you can see it and and i imagine that's an incredibly powerful uh moment when you yeah. plus the connection you feel, oh, yeah. you know, bonding with another person or an animal during tough times helps build so much resilience. So did you get the same horse? I'm curious, did you get the same well, horse each time or do they, did you have different horses? Well, because horses have different personalities, um, they really, they, they kind of started out with the easiest horse with me. And, you know, and there's this, and I talk about this in the book, that there's this, you know, really dark big, massive horse out in the pasture. He's the horse that everybody's afraid of. All the other horses know that they're in his tribe. You know, they, they're, he's the boss. And um, I mean, if you can just picture like the black stallion and it's, he's just very mysterious and, and scary looking. And, um, and I'll never forget the day my, my therapist said, okay, we're going to work with Rex today. And I was like, no, no, we're not. And she was like, yeah, we are. And, you know, and he ended up, um, being my horse, you know, I mean, he is the one who really took me on the healing journey because, oh, I mean, oh, just thinking about it, um, he was that thing that I was most afraid of, and he was that thing I was most afraid of facing. And going through that journey of trying to harness this horse that I was incredibly afraid of, I mean, just crying and having anxiety, um, and him like running away from me, he could just kept running away from me because. I was so fearful of him and, but me having that task of having to harness him and every week learning and teaching him to walk beside me as a partner and not like drag me around 
you know, as he was, you know, bossing me around. Um, it was really, it was just such um, an incredible experience to have that last session of him and I just walking beside each other, me not having to tug and him not pulling, but him just walking beside me because he knows he was my friend and he was my partner. And to hear that therapist tell me, you're where you need to be. And yeah. I think we all know that this is your last session. I mean, and that was just hmm. incredible. It's almost like a metaphor for the grief experience, isn't it? Like at first you're, you know, the buck and bronco is pulling you around, Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, but over with, through some work, through different, different types of yeah. modalities and, and different types of support, we become mm -hmm. where we're walking beside the grief. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, um, it wasn't just us learning to walk beside each other, but it was me learning to be honest with myself and being able to name why I feel a certain way, you know, what's triggering it, talking those areas out and seeing the reaction from the horse. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it was, it was nine months. Um, they say that, three months of horse therapy is equivalent to three years of talk therapy. Mm -hmm. So I did nine months of horse therapy. So I pretty much got nine years of, of uh, talk therapy in nine months. And for you, it was more helpful. It was. Yeah. It was incredible. You know, and animals, they don't have a need to lie. I mean, yes. sometimes my dog might lie that he was fed, not fed when he was fed, but when it comes to the emotional stuff, they just aren't motivated to lie. They're such great barometers. So um, I'm glad you shared that that modality with, with us because there might be some people listening who where equine therapy would resonate uh, maybe more so than mm -hmm. talk therapy, which, yeah. you know, isn't a requirement for grief work. You know, right. sometimes it's expressive arts. It's getting mm -hmm. into your body. It, it depends. It's different for each person. Yeah. You just um, have to find out what, what it, what it is for you. That's going to help you. Sometimes yeah. it's just people, um, getting involved, getting involved in whatever, getting involved in organizations, just volunteering, you know, whatever that is for you, that's going to help move you forward. Um, do it. You know, it doesn't have to be tailored to one thing. Right. And sometimes it's a little trial and error, you it know, is. where you might try a couple things oh, yeah. that don't work and then that will, you know, something resonates and lands. Um, mm -hmm. And so not to give up, I think on the first, like you said, you tried th talk therapy. It wasn't particularly helpful for you. Right. Could be for someone else, but you, right. you just tried this thing and it worked. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that takes a little fearlessness because I think anyone going into grief work uh, with a professional, whether it's a horse professional or a human professional, it's scary because yeah. you're having to turn towards the pain. And, and I think that's one of the scariest parts of grief. I mean, it's scary just to feel overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but then to say, I am going to look at what this is there can be a lot of resistance there, oh, yeah. but yeah. once, but it's the only way out is through, you know, is to, yeah. to actually look at it. And you're not really even out, you know, when I say out, I think what I mean is out of the overwhelm to where you can have that equanimity with it because you're never actually out. Yeah. Well, so, and it's not like every single week you're like, Oh, I can't wait to go. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's forcing yourself to go. Yeah. You know, forcing yourself to do the work. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what are the fruits of that for you? You know, who is Renee now? What, you know, um, how are you similar? How are you different? Um, well, well, I, let me take, this takes me into, um, you know, siblings feeling like they are um, living in that shadow of their hero's death. And, and, and that does not take away from what our siblings did, their sacrifice, the pain of the loss, who they are as a person. Um, I think it just, you know, siblings just feel like that inability to 
measure up or, um, I mean, there, there's such incredible honor that comes that's in a military loss. I mean, to me, it's, it's the, the highest honor is to sacrifice your life for your, for your men, for your country, for your family. Um, you know, and, and not that they go into it thinking that they just, they do it because, you know, they love, you know, they love their, their, um, you know, they're Marine. Well, my, my husband, oh, I mean, my brother was a Marine, so my husband's Air Force, um, you know, so they just, they do it because, um, you know, they love what they do. They love their country. And so there is honor that comes with that. And I think siblings can feel, how can I ever live a life worthy that even compares to what my sibling did? How can I ever um, live up to that in my parents' eyes? How can they ever be proud of me the way they are proud of, um, you know, my sibling? And so for me, it was, um, I think just coming to that realization through my faith, um, you know, I'm a Christian and so, you know, not everybody has the same religious beliefs as me, but for me, it was, um, realizing that I have just as much value in, you know, um, being, being self-aware of that, that my life has just as much value. Um, it's just as important. Um, you know, it's, it's doing the grief work. It's, it's, um, realizing that I don't want to feel like this every single day when I wake up. And so there has to be a, a part of me that looks to something greater, something better. Um, you know, just, you know, having that hope that things can and will get better. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think in that you find that you find yourself, you find out who, I mean, I know there's all this, um, you know, lingo of finding yourself, you know, and, but, but truly it, you, you have to, um, you know, when you're, when you lose a sibling, you do, you do have to find yourself. You do have to find out what it is that makes you happy and motivates you in your life. And so is there one, you know, practice or whether it's from your, you know, your religious tradition or anything else, an attitude that you've cultivated um, that's helped support you? through this in addition to feeling worthy and, and yeah. feeling like, you know, there's something bigger, which are both very valuable. Um, you know, when we think of the, the aspects of post-traumatic growth, mm. you know, those mm -hmm. two fit right into there. Yeah. Um, but is there, you know, is there any, any other, again, attitude or practice or something that you can share with the, the listeners and viewers that might well, offer them a way? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm a mother of four children. I have a husband. I'm a military wife. My life is complete chaos. So <laughs> the, the only time that I get is, um, you know, at night after everybody's in bed. And that's when I do my most self-reflecting. Some people like to do it in the morning when they wake up, but I don't like to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> Um, I don't want to wake up an hour before everybody else. Uh, so I do it at night. You know, I just, I have an app on my phone. I read devotionals that I feel are pertinent to, um, to where I'm at in that moment. And so every night I try to read, you know, at least one day's devotions and, and I just find something, whatever speaks to me, you know, I, I don't try to be legalistic about it. I just try to find that one thing that speaks to me. Um, I will note take. So if I just have a thought that pops in my head, um, that needs addressed, I just like type it out real quick. You know, I typed out something last night. Um, it wasn't like this long prayer. It was just something I personally was struggling with and I jotted it down and I said, I hate feeling this way. And I was very specific as to what I was feeling and even just getting it out, you know, that, that helps, you know, um, 
So that goes back to being honest with yourself. It does. You know, and I I love that what you're sharing is that you're taking just, you know, a short time each night. It doesn't it doesn't have to be a half an hour or an hour or whatever, just a few minutes to connect to something that inspires you and lifts you up, which for you are the devotionals, um, that that helps bring some peace in what is a very chaotic life because, you know, when you're grieving, yeah. you know, and, and as, as early in or as far out, you don't get to put life on pause. Correct. You don't get to be like, hey, three-year-old, sleep. <laughs> for like months and you wouldn't want that anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's like life keeps happening. And so carving out the tiny bits of time, mm-hmm. you know, to feel love, to feel forgiveness, to feel joy, um, yeah. you know, to, to be honest with yourself too. I love that you're also weaving in some writing there mm-hmm. too. And I imagine that probably helps you sleep better. I would think. Oh, it does. You know, just like, just get that out there. Just get it out of your head, you know, before you go to sleep and, um, you know, it's just, that's, it, it's been incredibly helpful for me. I'm so glad. Well, thank you for sharing your time. And again, your, your full story, we didn't want to give everything away in the podcast, but yeah. you know, to learn more about, about Renee's, there's a lot in here about your brother, which I really appreciated reading and his service to the country and a lot in about your relationship with him. Um, and and your healing journey, and so this this book is a fabulous book from a fabulous, caring, loving woman. And I'm wondering if if people want to know more about you or or contact you, what should we do? Uh, well, you can go to my website, ReneeNichol.com. I can spell it for you. It's also on the cover of the book, but it's R E N E E N I C K E L L. And, um, and there's ways to contact me. Uh, there's actually a contact link you can go on there and it sends an email directly to me. I do always try to answer my emails. Um, I, you can also reach me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page at R, R M nickel. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, so you can, there are numerous ways to contact me. Facebook messages. I, I really, I get inundated with Facebook messages. Um, so sometimes I don't, I'm not always so quick to respond on, on social media, but email is probably the best way to, to contact me. Great. Thank you. And I will pop up your, your webpage for those of you who are watching and those of you who are listening. I will put that information in the show notes if you are listening to this through a podcast service such as iTunes so that you can, can have access to that. So is there any, any final words you want to say before we say adieu? Oh, gosh, there's hope. There oh. really is. And I know when you're six months out or you're a year out and you know, and I've been there, I've struggled with depression and anxiety. And, you know, I've had to take antidepressants. And there were moments where I just didn't want to live anymore. There truly was. Um, And that it just makes me so emotional to think to go back to that time. But there's hope, you know, um, Mm. you can get through it, you will get through it, you are strong enough. And, um, and I'm here. And there's people There's people who have been there who are here and want to help. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Namaste. I appreciate you coming on and and being your true, honest, uh, loving self. So thank Thank you. you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mindfulness and Grief Podcast. If you found what you heard useful, please consider rating, reviewing, or subscribing to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more grief support, please visit our website at mindfulnessandgrief.com, where you will find free guided meditations, supportive articles, and online courses and groups. Special thanks to our sound engineer, Todd Campbell and to the Atomic Mosquitoes for the opening and closing music. I'm Heather Stang, and I hope these teachings will be of great benefit to all who receive them. Until next time, namaste. Namaste.